Vibrant, vibrant, vibrant music teaching. Proven and practical tips, strategies, and ideas for music teachers. This is the Vibrant Music Teaching Podcast. I'm Nicola Canton, and in this episode, we're looking at teaching technique to older beginners. You can find the accompanying article for this episode at colorfulkeys.ie slash 135. Hey there, beautiful teachers. This is the last in our little series about teaching older students to play, teaching adult beginners and older students in general. And today we're going to look at the topic of technique as it relates to our older beginner students. So when we're teaching technique to older students, I think a lot of the problems we come across are actually not that we need to differentiate the instruction. They're actually that we feel we need to, but we shouldn't be. What am I talking about? What I mean by that is a lot of our reservations, a lot of the issues we come across with teaching technique to older beginners come from the fact that we try to teach adults differently in general, which is right, but when it comes to technique, we should actually be doing a lot of the same basic things that we need to do with younger students. I know I've fallen into this trap a lot of times, where I've been reticent to approach something with an adult student, and it's come back to bite us later, and it's not helpful for me, and it's not helpful for them. So I don't want to be nagging them to sit up straight or to adjust their bench if I've already told them that once or to have curved fingers or to do this or that. And because it feels more like nagging or it feels more stuffy when I'm talking to another adult, it can be hard to have that conversation or it can be hard to just have those nudges. Whereas when you're dealing with a kiddo, You just put in the reminders. You just do it naturally. Sit up. Oh, plant your feet, you know. But if you're saying that to an adult, it feels somehow condescending. It shouldn't, but it does. So the overriding thing that I want you to take from this episode, before we even dive into the specifics, is don't be afraid to have a similar approach that you have for kids. There are unique challenges that adult students have that kids do not come across, but don't be afraid to discuss technique with your adult students and don't be afraid to remind them about things and take similar approaches that you do with your younger students as well. Starting with posture. This is one of the things that a lot of us don't talk about enough with adult students. Sitting up tall, having the right bench height, having the right bench distance, having a curved hand shape, all of these things, or in fact, especially those first two, the right bench distance and height, those things cause so many of the issues that are out there. So many of the problems that students face, that teachers are trying to find a solution to. You'll see a a photo in a forum or somewhere And the teachers wonder, how do I get this student to stop doing X, Y, Z? How do I get them to have their wrists at the right height? Or how do I get them to stop having tension in their shoulders? And you look at the photo and the bench is at the wrong height or the wrong distance. (laughs) Comes back to those basics so much of the time, which is incredible. So don't discount them. They are incredibly important factors. Make sure to have that conversation with your older students when they start lessons. Explain the correct height and distance for the bench and how to check it. Explain how they need to do this at home. Encourage them to take a quick selfie of themselves at home if they want to check it with you. Or get a spouse or friend to take a photo of them sitting at the piano so that you can check it and emphasize the importance of this. You can do it with a friendly tone. It doesn't have to sound stuffy and boring. But if you skip these basics, you're doing a disservice to your students. Getting them sitting correctly right from the get-go. And reinforce it later. If they come back and they're not sitting correctly, tell them about it. I have one teen transfer student I can think of in particular. I should say young adult now, actually. He's a young adult at this stage. He transferred to me as a teen. And 
straight away when he came in, I mean, he'd been learning for something like eight, nine years at that stage. Something like that. And he hadn't been taught how to check the vent. I mean, he really hadn't. Maybe it was broached at the very start, but it hadn't been recently. And I say that with assurance that I wouldn't normally with a transfer student, right? A lot of the time, you can't say it was the previous teacher because the student might just not have been paying attention or they had some aversion to it or whatever. But this student is very diligent and very focused and pays attention to details like that. If you tell him something that's important and explain why it's important, he will make sure to check it next time. If he's reminded about it even once, he says, oh yeah, yeah, you explained that to me. He's very serious about it, right? So I don't think it was broached with him more recently than several years back at the, at the earliest. So this just underlines the importance of having this conversation with your student. Because now he's gotten to the habit of checking the bench every single time because he knows I'm going to ask about that. And that's just holding someone accountable to something that's beneficial for them. It's not being a stuck in the mud or annoying. Although I do completely understand when teachers feel like they come across that way when they talk about technique. When you are first introducing technique, or the basics of posture, I should say, to your older students, I highly recommend you do it alongside them. Because the other issue with teaching posture to students is not just us feeling stuffy and not doing it, it's the embarrassment of it. It's quite awkward to talk about our own bodies and where they're positioned, and maybe this is a problem in our society, but it feels a bit awkward and weird. And so if you have a second piano, I'd really encourage you to sit down at the second piano when you're explaining this and do the motions with your students. If you don't, just do it as if you have an imaginary piano in front of you sitting on your teaching chair. So sit and show them how you're moving to the front of the bench. And I always slide all the way back to show them how my legs are restricted when I'm sitting all the way at the back of the bench. I show them how to test their distance by tapping their knuckles on the full board or whatever your system is, but do all of these motions with them. Have them do it at the same time as you. It just feels so much more comfortable when someone is doing these silly gestures at the same time. And you might not think that they feel silly, but for a newbie, they definitely do. They feel awkward and weird. So do it alongside your students. Plant your feet firmly on the floor, dramatically if you can and scooch to the front of the bench and the back of the bench and have them do the same so that they feel the difference, all of those things. The second foundational element with older beginners is to teach non-legato first. And this is another one that I do with all my young students, but maybe we can be reticent to do with an older student because it feels a bit stranger to them. So a young student comes in, if we tell them to play non-legato, play this bouncy way or whatever way we phrase it, they just take it, right? They're not, they don't have the same frame of reference. An older student, though, they have heard people playing piano and they've normally heard more legato than non-legato because that's what we all listen to. And so they're going to try and emulate that right away. But if they do play smoothly right away, it tends to lead to a lot more tension because they're not going to use their arm weight to play. And this is an even bigger problem with older students than it is for younger ones. Older students, older people have all these habits that we've built up over the years. We all have them. We hold our shoulders in this stiff, odd manner, or we lean our neck slightly forward, or we have a way of dropping our wrists down that we've practiced while we're typing on a computer keyboard. We have all these ingrained ways of moving through the world. And that means it's even more important to start with non-legato so that your student can practice having the right motion and falling into each key with their whole arm. Once they get used to that, they'll be able to develop into legato playing. And for some adults, this will happen faster than others. I'd say particularly for young adults, it actually develops quite quickly that they can play that way and they're free of tension. But the older they are, the more ingrained habits they have and the more tension they tend to build into their playing. So I would stick with non-legato playing for quite a while, especially with my older students, but just watching how they're developing, watching their wrist position, watching the way in which they're moving. Now, one key difference in how I approach technique with older beginners is to actually explain more of the anatomy that's going on. 
Instead of just giving them an animal analogy or talking about balloons lifting wraiths into the air, I do that too. But instead of just doing that, I also want to explain the logic of why we're doing this movement or that movement and how it connects to the sound. I do this to some degree with younger students, but much more so with adults. So I explain uh, the tendons in a rudimentary way. It doesn't have to be a complicated scientific understanding of it. But explaining the tendons and the muscles that are involved and simple things like picturing an elastic band attached from your elbow to the tip of your knuckles, I find to be a useful frame of reference, accurate or not accurate, but it is a a frame of reference that helps you to picture that when you drop your wrist or raise your wrist, your elastic band is stretched, right? So that helps you understand the idea of a tendon. Basics like that, talking about the anatomy that's involved, is a really useful, almost secondary approach to teaching technique with adult students. So it goes alongside the other stuff we're doing, the physical stuff. Actually understanding the anatomy behind what we're doing, the logic behind what we're doing, is a big thing for adult students. More so some than others, but all of them, I believe, at least a basic understanding of this is very useful. And I've really found it to make a big difference in terms of what actually makes it through to the practice room, right? Not just doing it at the lesson, but whether they're actually practicing or not. When they understand the anatomy and the logic behind what we're doing, that makes a big difference. If you're curious about this, there's a great book I think you should check out. It's called What Every Pianist Needs to Know About the Body. It's by Thomas Mark, and we'll leave a link in the article that goes along with this episode on the Colorful Keys blog. So the pictures in that book are really useful to show to your students. So even if you don't read the whole thing yourself, or they don't read it, or you don't recommend they buy it, just showing them the pictures is a really useful illustration for the anatomy of good technique. My last little tip for you is about scales, because scales always come up when we talk about technique. Scales can be played with any technique, And most commonly, they're done as drills, up and down, legato, right? But that's not all scales are. And so when you approach scales with your older beginners, I want to encourage you not to go for the legato first, not only because we're not teaching legato at that stage, but because that turns into a drill really fast, and it's going to be a very slow drill for quite a while. Because if you're just starting to learn to play, especially if you're on the older side and some of the movements are quite awkward even when you understand the logic, it's going to take a long time for that C major scale to be hands together and fluid and quick. Which means it's going to take a long time to get to G and a really long time to get the whole way through the circle of fifths or whatever pattern you're learning them in. So wait on that. But right from the get-go, introduce scales as an improvisation activity. Don't teach the fingerings and the patterns, don't teach them similar and contrary motion, just teach scales as a concept through improvisation. You can do this by just starting with a simple accompaniment for improv in C major. So start in C, you just tell your student they can play anything they want on the white keys, For some, that'll be fine. For some, that'll be very intimidating. So definitely, if that's the case, give them some more instruction or demonstrations. So if you start a simple chord accompaniment, you can show them, just play three notes on the white keys and say, see, like this, while you're keeping your accompaniment going in your left hand, you demonstrate C, D, E or something. And they'll see that actually, pretty easy to make it sound good. You just play three keys and they can come in and out. They don't have to do you know, fluid melodies the whole time. They can just do a few notes at a time. I'd also be encouraging them to play non-legato so that they're using this as an opportunity to practice using their arm weight and all of that good stuff. And then you can start to explore other keys, adding a sharp in, etc, etc, all doing it, hopping around with just finger two, or as they do meet legato, maybe introducing that as well. This is a great exercise for improvising, loosening up, Getting into the technique of playing non-legato without doing any kind of technique drill, understanding keys and key signatures, chords, and what a scale is, and just really getting inside all those concepts before you ever meet a legato scale that you're supposed to play in a certain sequence or a certain way. If you haven't ever done this with scales, 
please try it. It will honestly revolutionise everything you think about scales and how your students think about them. This is the basics behind the course inside Vibrant Music Teaching called the Circle of Fifths Odyssey. This course takes you on a journey, you and your students on a journey through the whole Circle of Fifth with games and improvisation all along the way to explore each key. It's a fantastic way to get yourself used to the idea of improvising as a way to teach. So if you're curious about that, if you're a member, you can find it in the library. If you're not a member yet, you can sign up at vmt.ninja and you get access straight away to that as well as all our other courses. Everything's available to you straight away, but that would be a great place to start if you're curious about this idea of using improv to teach scales and keys. Now it's time for you to tell me. What do you find you change about your teaching of technique when it comes to older students? What's different about the way you teach technique for your older students than the way you do it for younger students? I'd love to hear from you. You can leave a comment on the article that goes along with this post. That's at colourfulkeys.ie on our blog. You could also find me on Facebook or Instagram where Colourful Keys with two U's everywhere. Pretty much Colourful Keys to use. So I'd love to hear from you. Let me know what you think and I'll see you next week. Bye for now. Vibrant Music Teaching members get five new games or resources at least every single month that keep them inspired and wanting to become a better teacher each and every day. If you want to join the best community of teachers online, you can go to vmt.ninja and sign up today.